Good morning. We are going to go ahead and get started. Let's open in prayer. Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you for those that will listen. I pray that you would help us to rightly divide your word of truth, that we could understand what you have for us today. And I thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So we are going to be in Genesis 46, but we're starting with a story today. Okay. Let me back up just a tad. Here we go. Okay. So we're starting with seven-year-old Tommy had been asking his parents for a dog, but they were not convinced that the family needed one. After Tommy's repeated pleas, his dad told him if he would help his mother with chores around the house, he could earn enough money to buy a dog. So Tommy has, was more than eager to accept the challenge, and he didn't mind working if it meant that he could get a dog, okay? So his parents took Tommy to a pet store in town to see what they had in line of dogs. And near the rear of the store was a cage containing a beautiful black and white puppy. So for Tommy and the puppy, it was love at first sight. While Tommy was occupied visiting the puppy that was sure he would own, his dad was negotiating with the store owner regarding the price. And finally, it was agreed that $100 was a fair price. Now, Tommy's dad knew that his son's earnings plus his allowance wasn't up to that figure, so he wrote the owner a check for $90 with the provision that Tommy would be told that he had to come up with $10 if he wanted the puppy, which just so happened to be the amount of money Tommy had, right? So Tommy eagerly counted out his $10, paid the owner, and Tommy had already named the dog Spots by the time he got home, right? So for a couple years, wherever you saw Tommy, you saw Spots. One weekday morning, as was his custom, Tommy gave Spots a big hug before he left to catch the bus for school. And what Tommy didn't realize was that he failed to latch the gate. It did not take much of a win to blow a, the gate open and Spots was out exploring the neighborhood. So when Tommy got home from school, he immediately hid at the backyard to play with Spots and noticed that Spots was missing. Tommy's mother called the pound, and sure enough, there was Spots. So when they found out that Spots had already been put in a cage, Tommy asked the attendant if he could go back and see his dog, and the attendant replied that it would be $25 fine to get Spots because he was running loose in the neighborhood. Tommy's mother reminded him that his carelessness had caused the problem. And so Tommy agreed to pay the fine, and Mom agreed to help him by loaning him the money, and he could work it off. Soon Spots and Tommy were reunited, and on the way back home, Tommy hugged Spots real tight and told him he loved him. And he said, I bought you when you were a puppy, and now I have bought you out of the pound. Spots, you are my dog twice over. So redemption is the act of buying back. Man is God's creation, but when sin entered the human race, that relationship was broken. When Christ died for our sins and we claimed his sacrifice, we were bought by the blood and born again into the kingdom of God. Thus, we're God's property twice over, first by creation and later by regeneration. And we can see that in the story of Jacob and his son Joseph. He was his favorite son. And now we see that relationship being redeemed by him being able to see his son again. And that's what we will have. We have that hope of heaven. And we will see the Son of Christ again, the Son of God again. And that's what we see in our story today. So we are in Genesis. Redemption is the, is the key word. Jesus redeemed us from who we were to what we will become. He bought us back from sin. And Joseph was bought back from his life that he once had to a new life, to a new relationship with his father, to a new place in history because of the providence of God that we learned about yesterday, right? Okay, so we're in Genesis 46. So Israel set out with all that was his, and when he reached Beersheba, he offered sacrifices to the God of his father Isaac. Now when Israel set out, what is that about? Israel, remember, is Jacob. Jacob uh, was renamed by God when he renewed his covenant with him and God gave him the name Israel. The fact that he set out is because of the famine. He moved as a direct result of a tragedy, of a heartache, of a trial in his life. 
I think we can all identify with that. There are hard things that happen to us and we don't understand why, but it's God that purposes those things to happen and uses them according to his will and his glory. And then he went and he reached Beersheba. Beersheba is the place where Abraham, his grandfather, and Isaac, his father, had also offered sacrifices. So this is a family heritage of giving God glory and honor. Is that what we have in our lives? Is that what you have in your life? Are you sharing that heritage with your family? Verse 2. And God spoke to Israel in a vision at night and said, Jacob, Jacob. Here I am, he replied. I am God, the God of your father. He said, do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for I will make you into a great nation there. I will go down to Egypt with you, and I will surely bring you back again, and Joseph's own hand will close your eyes. Right here, he's saying in verse 3, I am God. Do not be afraid. We all need to be reassured of God's love, care, and presence as we face the difficulties and the decisions that we have to make in our lives. And because of those difficulties and those decisions, God needs to sometimes come in and say, I am God. Don't be afraid. And he does. We miss those situations because we become so engrossed sometimes, looking down at our situation. But we need to look up at our Redeemer. He has redeemed us for such a time as this. We are not a subject of the situation that we're in, but we are an overcomer by the power of God. God can where we can't, right? So we see that he is reaffirming his relationship with uh, Jacob. And these are the same words where he says, I am God, do not be afraid. I will make you into a great nation. This is the same promise that God had already given him in Beersheba years ago when he was fleeing from Esau before any of all this started. This is the same promise God had for him. And now this is God fulfilling that promise. How is God fulfilling promises in your life today? Give him the honor, give him the glory, share what God is doing in your life with others. All right, so we see that in verse 5. Then Jacob left Beersheba, and Israel's sons took their father Jacob and their children and their wives in the carts that Pharaoh had sent to transport him. And they also took with them their livestock and the possessions they had acquired in Canaan. And Jacob and all his offspring went to Egypt. He took to him, he took with him to Egypt the sons and grandsons and his daughters and granddaughters all his offspring. These are the names of the sons of Israel, Jacob and his descendants who went to Egypt. Reuben, the firstborn of Jacob. The sons of Reuben were, Reuben were Hanok, Palu, Hezron, and Carmi. Verse 10. The sons of Simeon. Let's, let's just recap of who each son is. Reuben. Reuben is his firstborn son. Reuben lost the place of the firstborn son when he slept with his his dad's concubine. He no longer had that place of honor as the firstborn. He lost that. So he is the firstborn, but he's not respected as the firstborn. Simeon. The sons of Simeon were Jemuel, Jamin, Ohad, Jackin, Zohar, and Shal, the son of a Canaanite woman. Now Simeon is the one that Joseph kept in jail the first time that the brothers came until they returned with Benjamin. Simeon is also the one with Levi who deceived all of the town of Shechem when their sister Dinah was raped by the son of that town. And they killed all the men and took all the women and children. So he wasn't very well regarded in the family either, even though he's the second born son. Okay, so now the sons of Levi. Oh, and then we also see in the sons of Simeon, Ohad and Zoar. Now in all of the different translations and texts, if you add up the amount of sons that are supposed to be under this first wife, um, as we see here under Leah, Ohad is not in all of the manuscripts. 
what they believe is Ohad and Zohar are the same. Ohad was a mis mis a mis scribe, a mistake, shouldn't have been wrote. Because if you, as you compare all of them, it's not the one that's always listed. But Zohar is. So, because the words are so similar written in the original text, they believe that Ohad is not supposed to be there. Because if you add up all the sons, it doesn't come up to the right number. Just a bit of information for you. Okay, so we go on to Levi. The sons of Levi were Gershom, Kohath, and Merari. So these are the sons of Levi. Again, Levi is not regarded as, one, as the third-born son, as any kind of high standing because of what he did in Shechem, killing all the men by deceiving them with his brother Simon. In verse 12, the sons of Judah, Ur, Onan, Shelah, Perez, and Zerah. But Ur and Onan had died in the land of Canaan. So now we see... Okay, so now we see that Judah, Judah does have a place of honor. Judah is respected. Why? Because he is the one that stood up and spoke for the brothers before Joseph, after he was willing to take the blame if anything happened to Benjamin before his dad. So Judah, even though he's the fourth born son, is actually the leader of this family of these brothers, okay? And we do remember that Ur and Onan were evil and had died in Canaan. That's how he ended up with Tamar and having Perez and Zerah. Okay, so the sons of Perez, Hezron and Hemuel, the sons of Issachar, Tola, Pua, Jishab, and Shimron, the sons of Zebulun, Sered, Elon, and Jehiel. These were the sons of Leah, born, in Jake, born to Jacob in Padea Moran, because his daughter, because, besides his daughter Dinah. These sons and daughters of his were 33 in all. Okay, but if you add them up, there's actually 34 names. And 33, that's why they say that they believe Ohad, because it's not in all of the original text, is the mistake. Okay, verse 16. The sons of Gad, Zephon, Haggai, Shuni, Esbon, Eri, Aradi, and Areli. The sons of Asher, Imna, Ishva, Isvai, Berai, their sister Sarah, their sister Beriah, Heber and Malachel. These were the children born to Jacob by Zilpah, whom Laban had given to his daughter Leah. There were 16 in all. Okay, so the first group was Leah's sons, Leah's descendants, and then it was her concubine's descendants. Well, her servant given to Jacob as a concubine. Okay, verse 19. The sons of Jacob's wife Rachel, Joseph and Benjamin, and in Egypt, Manasseh and Ephraim were born to Joseph by Asenath, daughter of Potiphar, priest of On. Okay, so we see in that one that those were included in Jacob's lineage, even though they were born in Egypt. So the sons of Benjamin, Bela, Becker, Ashbel, Gera, Naaman, Ehi, Rosh, Muppam, Huppam, and Ard. Yeah. Muppum, Huppum, and Ard. Those are a crack up. They, these were the sons of Rachel who were born to Jacob, 14 in all. And the sons of Dan, Husham, and the sons of Natali, Jahil, Guni, Jezer, Shilliam. These were the sons born to Jacob by Billa, whom Laban had given to his daughter Rachel. Billa, the one that Reuben had slept with. There were seven in all. All those who went to Egypt with Jacob, those who were his direct descendants, not counting his son's wives, numbered 66 persons. Now we see that it says 66 persons, and those are the people that traveled with Jacob to Egypt. Now this is minus in verse 12 where we see the, the two sons of Judah that died, and this is minus the two sons born to Joseph that were already in Egypt, okay? 
And then in verse 27, with the two sons who had been with Joseph in Egypt and the members of Jacob's family, which were in Egypt, were 70 in all. Again, this is minus the two sons of Joseph. And then we see, I mean, it's adding the two sons of Joseph. Okay, so we see that, and then Joseph also had uh, grandsons in Egypt. Okay, so we're now in verse 28. So now Jacob sent Judah ahead of him to Joseph to get directions to Goshen. Again, just like we mentioned about Judah before, he's sending Judah because he is pretty much considering him the oldest son, the head of the house, the one that's in charge of the brothers. Okay. And when they arrived in the region of Goshen, Joseph had his chariot made ready and went to Goshen to meet his father, Israel. As soon as Joseph appeared before him, he threw his arms around his father and wept for a long time. Israel said to Joseph, Now I am ready to die, since I have seen for myself that you are still alive. Then Joseph said to his brothers and to his father's household, I will go up and speak to Pharaoh, and I will say to him, My brothers and my father's household, who are living in the land of Canaan, have come to me. The men are shepherds. They tend livestock, and they have brought along their flocks and herds and everything they own. When Pharaoh calls you in and asks, what is your occupation? You should answer. Your servants have tended livestock from our boyhood on, just as our fathers did. He does this for a reason, okay? Then you will be allowed to settle in the region of Goshen, for all shepherds are detestable to the Egyptians. You know, just like there's racism and there's differences in cultures today, even though he's in the position he's in, the Egyptians do not associate with the with the Hebrews in this way. They won't want to live next to each other and they definitely won't want to ne live next to shepherds. And that's just how they were. They they found them detestable. It was an opposition that helped the Israelites stay separated. God can use opposition. God can use problems in society that keep people apart. God can keep people apart for a reason. And he used this reason to grow his people into the nation they needed to become. So look at your situation. Is God using your situation to keep you separated for a plan and a purpose that is bigger than you could possibly imagine? Don't always look at your heartache and your hard circumstance as God pushing down on you, but see it as God lifting you up and redeeming you for such a time. That's what God is doing right here. And we see that God has definitely worked out all this to his glory. And how is that possible? Why? Because they had a relationship with him. And if you have a relationship with Christ, then you also are able to do just what they're saying. What he's, what he's saying is that he's able to redeem this relationship. He was able to redeem this time. We see that what? What is God doing in your life? To cause you to be able to redeem a relationship like this one. The one between Joseph and his, brother, his father Jacob. Where? Where is God calling you to be a light? To be able to redeem? To be able to share the love of his redemption? When? When were you redeemed? When was God able to say to you, you're my child, and I'm buying you back from the life that you had to the life that I want to give you. And how? How can you have that redeemed life? And that's what we want to get to. Romans 3.23 says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So none of us deserve that redeemed relationship with God. But God, right? But God. So Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Because of that, good morning, Miss Sonia, because we have that redeemed relationship with God, we can have that hope of heaven. We can have that salvation. We can have that redeemed relationship with God. Romans 5.8 says, God's love is that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Just like Tommy's little puppy was in the, the pound and he paid the price to get him out. That's what we have. We have Christ who paid the price for us. Where our outcome would have been death, Christ said, no, I love you and I'm redeeming you and your outcome is going to be life. We have to choose Christ. 
The puppy didn't have that choice. But we do. We have to choose Christ. Christ has given us that opportunity to have that hope of heaven. And then we also see in Romans 10, 9 through 10, if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. So what does that mean for us? If we want that redeemed relationship, it has to be that we say it with our mouth, that we believe in our heart. And when we believe in our heart, we have a changed heart and that relationship with him is redeemed. And what does that look like? What is what is getting right with God and accepting that redeemed relationship look like? It's you coming before your God, coming before your king and saying, Lord, I fall short. I failed. Forgive me of my sin. Thank you. Thank you for dying for me. I ask that you would help me to be who you want me to be. I want you to be my savior. I want you to be my Lord. Help me today. I accept Jesus Christ as my Savior to guide my life in Jesus' name. Amen. It's you talking to God, accepting His, His redeeming self relationship with you, accepting that hope of heaven, accepting Christ's death on the cross for your sins. And then what happens? Romans 10, 13 says, Whosoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So you, it's not enough that you get your redeemed relationship. How are you sharing that redeemed relationship with others? How are you being bold in your life and saying and sharing and living? God has done this. I was here, but now I'm here because of the grace of God. And that's what God is asking for you today. For me today, for us today. What are we supposed to be doing? Be, be sharing. Be sharing with who? With the whosoever's that call on the name of the Lord that can be saved. We need to be, be what? Be in the word. We need to be in the word. We can't hear God unless we're in the word. That's him speaking to us. We need to be in prayer. Be in prayer is just you talking to God, sharing with God what's going on in your life. There's no special words. There's no special formula. God is a God that just hears you just like you're hearing me now. Share with God what's going on in your life. Be honest. You can be angry, you can be scared, you can be upset, you can be happy. God knows where you're at. You don't have to hide your feelings from God, but God wants you to share your feelings with him, right? So we need to be sharing with other people. We need to be in the word. We need to be in prayer. And lastly, we need to be involved in a Bible-believing church so we can grow and help others grow. So as you remember the word redemption today, Remember that you were redeemed from who you were to who you will become by the blood of Jesus Christ. Our redemption cost Jesus' life. What are you doing with your life? I love you too. Thank you, Miss Sonia. Uh, um, what are you doing with your life today? How are you sharing that love of God with others today? God has a plan and a purpose for you that is far greater than you possibly imagine. Somebody needs to know that they're redeemed today. Share that with them. It could change their life. You have a blessed day.